you know, honestly, the only regrets that I have is that I didn't go back to university earlier. I wish I had done that. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have gone in the direction that I've gone now. And I have absolutely learned to love the type of research that I engage in. And I want to keep doing it, you know, as long as possible. Hey, fellow workers, welcome to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode two of season three. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, as well as proud member of the Harbinger Media Network, broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsitapi. And we have a very special guest today. My guest is Mary Siever, an aspiring mother scholar. And I know that some of you out there might be wondering, oh, you have the same last name. Are you related? Well, we're not biologically related. However, Mary and I have, as of less than a week ago, when we're recording this message, celebrated our 29th wedding anniversary. So Mary is my spouse. I'm her spouse as well. Anyhow, I welcome Mary to the Alberta Worker Podcast. Thank you. Glad to have you here. So what we'll do is we'll just start off having you tell us your life story, where you grew up, your family life, what, your education, that sort of thing. As well, tell us your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, you know, the path you got to get there. And you can either integrate those two together or do them separately. So the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thanks, Kim. I grew up in British Columbia, the Lower Mainland, largely in the greater Vancouver area. I was born in Maple Ridge and spent most of my life there, moving out into Vancouver and to a few other areas within the Lower Mainland. Um, also lived in Penticton for about a year. So I spent most of my life there until three years after we were married and we moved to Alberta. I am the oldest of seven children. My parents lived in Maple Ridge most of our growing up years. And as the oldest of these children, I had a lot of responsibility caring for them and being a babysitter. And that kind of started the stage where I thought initially my jobs would go is, is mostly in, in child care. That's not really what I wanted to do. I went to school there, graduated high school in 1989. And, and after that, um, I started working, though, like I did have some jobs previous to graduating high school. But I would say that really my first jobs were babysitting, not just my own family, but for other people. Being the oldest of so many children automatically made me a, a valid source for caring for other people's children. It took me a few years to realize that I really wasn't a fan of looking after other people's children, though I did continue in that later. So, you know, after high school, I became a nanny, had a few different nannying jobs. They didn't last terribly long. Most of them were just for several months at a time. You know, that was really the start of my working career. Actually, I did have a very brief job when I was about 15 years old. I think I was 15, 14 or 15, where I worked in a restaurant busing for only two weekends. I don't think I knew this. Oh, well, yeah, like it, it was very brief. A friend of mine got me the job. I tried it out found that I really did not like it. I did not like being, um, first of all, working at that time of the day. Of course, I did end up working at that time of the day in other jobs. I had different types of jobs throughout the years. Some of them were very short term and mostly because it's not necessarily that I lost interest. It's just so much that I just didn't feel suited to do those jobs. After I graduated, I did work in a well dry cleaner slash laundromat for some time. I didn't know this one either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, no, that was after high school. And I also worked at a gas station, graveyard shift. I knew that one. Yes. I discovered I do not like working in the middle of the night. I don't like it. I'm not good at nighttime. So that kind of kiboshed any ideas of pursuing a job that would require me to do that. Hey, let's see. Well, I mean, I, I held lots of different little jobs at different times, but it wasn't until, well, in 1990, I moved to Ireland for almost a year. There, I couldn't do anything else but work as a nanny. And so that's what I did. I worked as a nanny there. I lived on my own. I also had roommates at one point, but I worked as a nanny. I wasn't able to legally hold any other position. I was very young. I, well, I was 18 when I first moved there and I was very young and wasn't really up on, you know, all the laws of what to do. But after I came back, I 
went back to work as a nanny. That's kind of what I thought I could do. Like, as I said, I didn't really enjoy it. It's not that I didn't enjoy interacting with the children. I didn't like how I was relegated to a particular position within that family. I wasn't part of the family, but expected to do all this childcare and, and household labor and sometimes cooking, but was still treated as an outsider. And I've come to realize that this is an industry, the childcare industry, or you know, when people have live-in nannies or if they have nannies that live outside of the home, but they come in, they're often treated like that but it's even particularly challenging for those who are temporary foreign workers, for example. At least my experience was that a lot of families preferred people to come from outside of the country to come and care for their children. The main reason being is they didn't have anything that would take them away from their responsibilities or not much to take away from their responsibilities for looking after the home and family and, and kids and, and such. I just feel that in many ways, it's a very exploitative industry and that often these carers are put in a position where they don't have many options outside of that and they're expected to devote much of their time. That was my experience in a couple of the jobs that I had as a nanny where I I was expected to alter my social life to benefit the family. There's only one situation where I didn't feel that was the case, and that was when I was working as a nanny in Penticton when I lived there. I felt it was a much more collaborative relationship with the family. It was a single mom. She had three kids. The youngest was a toddler. She worked as a lab assistant, and so she was busy, and she had her own challenges, but she didn't treat me like I was you know, someone who was just there to take care of things and, and such. Was she the only one where she was the only parent in the family? Were all the other times that you've nannied, were they all like dual parent families? Yeah, yeah. And what if that played into it? The fact that she didn't have a partner with her? It might have, can't say for sure. But the other families that I worked for, they were more affluent, you know, somewhere in Vancouver. I mean, there was a time I briefly did that after we were married as well. I worked as a nanny, but that was short-lived as well. But yeah, they were a little more affluent. They had a few more choices. They had these expectations. I understand when you're hiring someone to do this, you have these certain expectations. But I think it's also easy, especially if they live in, it's easier to take advantage and expect them to be on duty all the time. It was never very well paid either. I can't say what it's like now, but it was not very well paid. And another reason when I had live-in situations, that was also a reason why I'd get a reduction in pay because you're getting that benefit that- You don't have to pay rent. Right. You know, yeah. And I think that's one reason too, they do that to save costs. Sure. And there's a lot of things I could say about the whole childcare industry and, you know, and how it all plays out and- Domestic labor in general. Yeah. I mean, I do think I had a lot of privilege. First of all, I knew my rights, whereas there are a lot of childcare workers who don't know all their rights, especially if they're coming from outside of the country. And, you know, this is a new experience for them. Also, when I was in Penticton, so this was in 91, 91 to 92, I think, I worked at Tim Hortons for a while. Tim Hortons was a little different than it is now. This was when they were making their own donuts in store. You used to have an actual baker. We had a couple of bakers. Yeah. They worked, I'm trying to remember if they worked alternate shifts. There were at least two that I remember. Yeah, they often worked alternate shifts because I can't remember if our Tim Hortons was open 24 hours. It might've been. I had the like four to 11 shift. That was late. That was challenging, but I enjoyed it. I can't say that I loved the food industry. I don't know. There was a good relationship with the other employees. This is also when other employees were allowed to smoke inside. So there were times when I was taking my break and a fellow employee was taking a break and smoking right there, right across from me, which uh, was a little bit challenging sometimes for, and I, I, at the time, I didn't think it was going to affect me, but I remember not enjoying that smoke blowing in my face. They didn't smoke while they were cooking though? No, this was back in the staff room. So it wasn't 
right next to food, right. but it wasn't that far away either. Sure. You think about it, like, you know, that was getting into it. And like I said, this was the a different time. Did you get any free food from Tim Hortons when you were working there? Yes. They, and I don't know if they do it now or not. There were two Tim Hortons in Penticton at the time. I don't know how many there are now. And the one I worked at, it was the downtown one. Yeah, I think it was the downtown one. They would box up like a, you know, one of those lard boxes. They would box one of those up with day old donuts and donate it to the soup kitchen. I don't know if there was anything else that they donated, you know, um, as well, but we were allowed to take up to like a, a donut size box of donuts home that got old kind of fast, but I would do that. And I, sometimes I would bring it home for, you know, my aunt lived there and my grandparents lived there. Sometimes I would bring it home for them or for friends. It, it was initially kind of fun, but you do get kind of tired of those after a while of, you know, bringing home donuts all the time. I think after that, I worked at a store in Vancouver Pacific center for some time. It was a cotton ginny, which doesn't exist anymore. I did not really enjoy retail either, but I still enjoyed the camaraderie with my fellow employees. I'm also not a good salesperson. So if people were coming in, I was supposed to kind of upsell them and I didn't enjoy doing that. You know, it's like, if you need this, you need this. If you don't, I don't want to try and push you. But I did like the discount on the clothes and we were expected to wear the clothes from there. So that was kind of nice. I had a tendency to take advantage of these benefits as an employee to, you know, overspend and, you know, buy too much. So I did that. And after that, when you and I first got together, I was working as a nanny. I was living with roommates and traveling out to UBC to nanny for a professor couple who were on sabbatical in Vancouver from Ontario. After that, I had a few different jobs. One of them was a short stint as a nanny once again. And then I, at that point, I decided, no, I'm done with that. I just didn't want to look after anyone else's children again. And I'm glad there are people who are willing to do that, but it just wasn't my field that I enjoyed. I worked at a sewing store for some time. I can't even remember how long I worked there now. That was Mason's Sewing Machine in Vancouver, where there was one in Surrey. That's where I generally worked, though I sometimes worked in Vancouver. I remember at one point going out to Vancouver during the garbage strike. So this was, what, 97, 96? Maybe about 96? I don't think it was 97, because I don't think I'd started at Douglas College yet. Unless it was like the... Oh. Early 97, because I started in September 97. So yeah, my guess would be 96 or early 97. Yeah. So I think it was then. And I still remember that. I still remember the smell of garbage during that strike. But I mean, that had nothing to do with the work that I did. In that, that was a different kind of job because uh, like the employees were expected to not only understand the machines because we were selling them and we were supposed to understand, you know, about sewing and how to do it. And I was not a great sewer, but I learned how to sew. I'm still not a great seamstress, but I learned how to do some sewing and I enjoyed it because we were kind of required to make some items, you know, for display and such. We did that. A lot of people would bring their machines machines in for repair. So there were sewing machines and sergers, there were embroidery machines. So I got to learn a little bit about what those machines were like and how they could be used. And of course, there were lots of people who would come in who had a lot of skill and, you know, really understood how to use these. So that was really interesting and engaging. I was able to purchase at a discount, a sewing machine and a serger. I think I gave the serger to Sinead. I don't know if Sinead still has it, but it was a pretty good one. You think you could still thread a serger if you had to? You know, it might come back to me. I don't know. At this point, it's been so long that I might not, but I, it might come back to me if I were to practice it for a bit. I don't know. The interesting thing is, I mean, some of our children have learned how to sew and, and Sinead's quite good at it. Since then, what have I worked at? Didn't you do some cleaning, some apartment cleaning or something for a little while? Oh, that's right. There was time and this was for a brief time as well, where I worked for a cleaning company, cleaning houses and such. That was all right. You know, we'd have to travel around and go clean people's houses. It was still, you know, it was not something that I stayed with, but it gave me an opportunity to learn some little tips for better cleaning skills and such. So 
I don't even know how long that was. That was a few months at least. Like up to this point, it doesn't sound like you had very long-term jobs, a lot of short-term jobs. I did. I wonder if there's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to work hard or physically hard. It's just that yeah, I did lose interest in them, but I also felt I was doing all this work and not getting a, enough payment, you know, that seemed to make it worthwhile. So there was that. Then after, you know, we started having children, I didn't work outside the home for quite a while, though I did try to run some businesses like Discovery Toys, Usborne Books. I think I even tried Tupperware very briefly. But again, I am the worst salesperson that ever existed. I can't sell anything. And I honestly feel that my primary reason for joining these companies was to get the free product, but it just did cost a lot of money. And I think that's mostly what I did, though I did teach voice lessons. I did some childbirth classes. You know, these are things that I did on my own or I did with someone else. Nutritional consulting. Yeah, nutritional consulting. I did that a bit as well because I did that distance learning and got my nutritional consultant certification. Um, I didn't keep registered with it though. So I did that as well. Oh, you were doing voice lessons through that school when we we're still in Vancouver. That's that's right. Yeah, I was teaching voice lessons through a music school that was kind of an at home. It's like they had different teachers who you go to their home to teach them. And so I did that. And that was shortly before we moved out to Alberta. You'd say that the bulk of your labor since moving to Lethbridge was child rearing and taking care of the home and stuff, domestic labor. Yeah, pretty much. We moved here when I was pregnant with Sinead, and that was in 98. But, you know, and I still did those few things when the children were small and, and such. Otherwise, yeah, that's I was, you know, just doing home stuff, looking after the children. And I didn't get a job for quite a while. Actually, I think after that, the, the first time I started applying for work was after... I finished my master's. You didn't have any paid work after your undergrad? I don't think so. Not that I recall. I didn't until after my like undergrad. Or maybe it was after my undergrad. Did I do anything after my undergrad? When were you in the School of Graduate Studies office? Was that after your master's? Yes. Okay. That was after. This is what happened. You know, raising the children. And then, of course, when Quillen was, what, about nine months old was when I started to realized I wanted to go back to school because I never got a university degree before that. That was my focus was I'd work these jobs and, and I wouldn't worry about it. But at the same time, I wanted to go to school. And so 2013, started going to the U of L and it took me six years. I got my undergraduate degree, but I couldn't get a job. There was nothing I could really do at that point because let's see, I graduated 2019. So Siobhan was, how old was she at that point? She was four. And so I was starting to look for work and the work I wanted to do, I couldn't get a position even with my education because they wanted more education. I discovered about not even halfway, like just partway through my undergraduate degree that I love doing research. And I, the type of research I like to do is social science research. So what was your degree in? My bachelor degree is in women and gender studies and English. So I have a double major right after that, like the semester after that was when I started my master's. This was in women and gender studies. I completed that in two years. So at that point, by the end of my master's degree, I was starting to look for work. What was your master's thesis on? My master's thesis thesis was on the student subject in university policies. I also did an undergraduate thesis at the end of my undergraduate degree, and that was on student parenting. That was something I really still wanted to pursue was parenting in many different aspects. And that's when I discovered that I wanted to pursue mothering studies. I wanted to get more engaged with uh, mothering scholarship. That was my plan with my master's, but didn't happen. The pandemic hit and that kind of created some logistic issues with how my master's thesis was going to go and we switched that. And so I studied the student uh, subject in university policies. I did do some work towards the end of my undergraduate degree and as well in my master's. And this was research assistant work for a couple of different profs at different times. And those were short contract 
terms. During my master's, I worked as a teaching assistant because as a graduate student, you're expected to have these like graduate teaching assistant responsibilities where you assist in the department with teaching. So that includes marking, sometimes teaching or, you know, getting engaged in the class in some way. And so I did that and I got paid for that. And I also had like since then different short-term contract research assistant jobs. But after I finished my master's, I worked in a few different short-term contract positions. I worked for the Canadian Women's Economic Council for a four-month term, and that was kind of a cross a national position. They're a nonprofit organization that supports women, primarily newcomers, to find work and, and to get involved. So I was working for that organization. Briefly, my supervisor was based in Quebec. I believe maybe it was Ontario. Actually, I think she was in Ontario. And there were other managers, uh, different parts of the country. One in Newfoundland and Labrador. Another manager was in BC, Vancouver area. Other employees, of course, spread out across the country in different capacities. So that was interesting because this was all online. The work I was doing was from home and our meetings were online and they would be scheduled in different time zones. So that was fascinating and challenging, but it still worked. I really enjoyed that organization because of the work that they're doing. It was really aligning with my own values and, and what I want to do. But I also have worked other short-term contracts. I worked about a year and a half for Women's Space here in Lethbridge, nonprofit organization that provides support for um, low-income women and their families, basically anyone who needs to support to file their taxes or to get, you know, with ID services and such. They're an organization that I've been involved with, you know, on a I was engaged with in other capacities, like on their board at one point, and they do great work and it's important work. So that's the kind of work that I want to do is supportive work to, to help those who are marginalized or who, who need those supports in different ways. Like, so nonprofit work is what I enjoy, I enjoy doing and I would have stayed with it if it had been more full-time, but it was part-time and not something that could you know, be sustainable in the, the long run. What were you doing for them? I was basically taking care of the office, you know, so taking care of emails. I was also doing the tax clinic. I would help file taxes. We had other volunteers who also do that. It is something they still do. I've had ongoing other research assistant work currently as i am just finished the first year of my PhD and I'm in the cultural, social, and political thought program at the University of Lethbridge. I've been working as a research assistant, currently as a graduate teaching assistant. Oh, something else I forgot was that previous to starting my PhD, I worked for a couple of different universities as a a sessional instructor. A couple of them have been online, something I'm doing currently right now for uh, another post-secondary institution in Alberta, and also some in person at the University of Lethbridge. That I've really enjoyed doing is engaging with students and teaching them, especially when I get the opportunity to teach women and gender studies courses, and I really enjoy the research assistant work, even though it's not full-time, but it's something that really is, I find, engaging the different topics that we get to engage in and the different work that we get to do so what are some of the courses you've been teaching well the first courses i taught i was te teaching two sessions of women and gender studies like the 1000 level at mount royal university and that was an online for one semester the semester after that i was teaching women and gender studies at the university of lethbridge and i was teaching feminist research that was the first time i taught that course and, th and then after that i started my phd studies and i was doing my own course work but i was also teaching our women and gender studies activism and advocacy and I love teaching that. That was in person at the University of Lethbridge. And this past semester for the UofL, I was teaching feminist research again. And this upcoming fall, I'll be teaching Women Gender Studies 1000 at the University of Lethbridge. So this is all as a sessional, not as a full-time contract position. And are you teaching right now? I am teaching online for Red Deer Polytechnic, not Women and Gender Studies. It's a business communication course, which at first had me a little bit panicking because I thought, now I'm not in business. How can I teach this? But they have a master course. All I've had to do is to teach the course, which I'm doing. I'm actually enjoying it, you know, or it's online as well. It's a little bit different. Like the, the assignments that the students have are all writing assignments. So there's like more of them than I've had in the past, you know, in the past, I've largely been marking papers longer 
writing assignments and and these are writing assignments but it's kind of a different focus it's about business communications it's going well red deer polytechnic their spring term and it's a shortened term you know like a summer term that would be half the the time as the others so and that's it for now great and so you're teaching in the fall uh at the university of lethbridge that's just a one semester uh, contract again yep so far they may ask me, I hope they do ask me to, to teach again, because I love the Women and Gender Studies Department at the University of Lethbridge is my department. I, I love it. You know, I, I want to help out as much as I can. And I love the excitement of students. So I, I'm sure you appreciate the fact that you have a contract, but I probably don't appreciate the precarity of it each, each semester. Yes, pretty much. I've had, especially in the last three years or so, I've just had contract positions. Oh, another one I forgot. I also was a writer for a short-term project, and this was like about a year ago, with Red Crow College. Right. They were doing the reaccreditation of one of their programs, and I was the writer for that um, project. So that required me, I mean, doing a lot of work at home, but also driving out, which was a lovely drive, to stand off every week. I think it was every week, wasn't it? It wasn't, yeah, it was It was once a week. Yeah, it was once a week, but you carpooled, so you would only, you personally would only drive every other week. Yeah, like we took turns. I was carpooling with someone else who was on the committee. So, yeah, and that was just for the summer. So until I, you know, started my other work because I was teaching after that so and so this summer that's what I'm doing is I'm teaching online I'm doing some analyzing of some surveys for the university as well so I'm writing out some reports for that I'm also going to be doing some other research assistant work I have some ongoing research assistant work for my supervisor it's all work I would find really engaging you know some of it's historical analysis you know archival work I'm not a historian but you know it's something I find really interesting engaging. I enjoy it. Cool. So you said you have finished one year of your PhD, so all your coursework is out of the way. And so what's the next step in the process? Well, my next step is this summer, I'm working on my research proposal that has to be finished and submitted to the SGS by the end of August. And after that, I will be working on my comprehensives. So that is where I do a lot of intense reading. I have some comprehensive exams I have to do. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. I think some of it is paper writing as well as there might be an oral exam component to it. But that's where I do a lot of intensive reading to become skilled and knowledgeable on certain topics that I want to become an expert in. I want to be a mothering scholar. I've discovered that I love researching topics around mothering and motherhood, parenting, and I want to pursue that more. I have not had the opportunity to publish yet. I really want to publish. I really want um, that to be part of my future. And I want to continue doing this type of research. Cool. Uh, a couple questions. So you said the SGS, that's School of Graduate Studies? School of Graduate City Studies at the University of Lethbridge. All right. And uh, how long do you expect your comprehensive to take? I believe that I have to complete them within a year. So okay. it'll start by the end of like the start of September, sort of end of August, and then I'll have a year to complete them. And then after that, I get to start my own research. All right. And that'll take a couple of years. Yeah. And what's your subject matter for your research? So my plan for my um, doctoral thesis, they call it a thesis, but I know some places dissertation, it's the same thing, is looking at the experiences of parents and caregivers who are accessing supports for their children who have ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, or and are on the autism spectrum. Initially, I was I was looking broadly at neurodivergency, but there are a lot of different neurodivergent conditions. And so I decided to focus on these two. There's a lot of relationship between them. So I want to see the experiences of parents and caregivers, how they're accessing supports and services. And I'm looking at it through a mothering lens. So I do have my own ideas about why it can be so challenging to get the supports needed. And that a lot of that has to do with the attitudes around mothering and mothering expectations. And so that's why that is a, a large part of my theory and analysis. And I'm looking at it also historically. I want to start from when autism was codified in the DSM, and that was in 1980. So I'm going to look at this from 1980 to the present time. And so I'm also hoping to talk to some adult children. I'm not going to be interviewing young children. I don't think that they could really provide a lot of information um, at this point. 
point, but adult children, as they're looking back on the experiences they had growing up with, you know, getting the services and support that they needed. And just also looking at policies, uh, whether they're school policies or healthcare policies and the rhetoric around these disorders and how that kind of relates to accessing support. Cool. I noticed you used the word mothering several times. Could you explain to the listeners what you mean by mothering? Well, mothering, it's just more of a practice. It's not about an individual. So this isn't just centered on a female subject who is known as a mother. This is kind of a whole concept of the practice of mothering. And I prefer to use the term mothering rather than the term motherhood. I will use motherhood. It's it's often used in, in other ways. But motherhood is, I mean, according to Adrienne Rich, who did a lot of theory arising on this, she looks at the institution of motherhood and patriarchal motherhood, like these imperatives about what a mother is supposed to do and what a mother is uh, supposed to be. And that is kind of centered in an ideological frame, but also this idea that a mother has to be a certain type of person who does certain things and live up to expectations. Mothering is more of a term that allows a person engaging in mothering, in the practice of mothering, or who identifies as such to have more, we'll say autonomy, but they can make those choices like of what mothering looks like and challenge these notions of what mothering can look like because it is a very varied experience. Anybody who engages in parenting broadly and largely those who engage in mothering will see it in different ways. They definitely have that flexibility so they can challenge these notions of what it means to be a mother and what it means to mother. And so that's what I'm, I'm looking at. When, you know, someone who becomes a parent feels that they have to live up to some certain ideology, they're bound to fail. You know, that's because there's there's no ideological way. And so this is what I'm in mothering studies, and it's a pretty expansive area of study. There are a lot of scholars that I've already looked at and that I will look at and I'll continue to look at and who I engage with who challenge these notions of what, you know, the mother should be or what mothering should look like. You know, this is why I want to look at that in this context of accessing and experiencing, you know, different care uh, responsibilities for their children. Cool. So that brings us to the present day then. I just wanted to go back a little bit. You said that you spent significant amount of your adult life, you know, being a a stay-at-home parent. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about your time as a stay-at-home parent where you didn't have a job where you performed labor for pay and that all the labor that you performed was unpaid and it was relegated to, you know, traditional mothering activities and that sort of thing. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on your time doing that. Yeah, I do have thoughts. I mean, because it was important to me. I realized, even though at the start, like I really wanted to uh, focus on being that stay-at-home parent, you know, as long as possible until my children were older and much more independent. And I thought that would satisfy me completely. But I realized it didn't satisfy me completely. There were other things I wanted to do, but it was challenging. I mean, part of this was when you were going out to work, it was, you know, and we only had one vehicle and it could be challenging for me to try and do things. Pretty much the whole time I was homeschooling as well. I enjoyed it in the younger years, not as much in the the high school years. And that brings an extra layer of unpaid labor that, you know, other stay-at-home parents don't have to take on. There's a lot of work involved, and especially if you wanted to do it in a specific way, it's a lot of work. It's unpaid and it's undervalued, even though there's this idea that, you know, the ideal mother or the other is is the one who stays home. It's the whole concept of the angel in the house, right? Looking after everything. I cooked. I cleaned house. I still like to have a clean house. You like the end result. I like the end result. You are a much better cook than I am, and you always have been. Though I'm not saying I was bad. I don't think I'm a bad cook, and I still do a little bit of cooking. Nobody died as a result of your cooking. No. (laughs) But it's not something I really enjoy doing. And cleaning house. I'm not going to say I enjoy doing it. 
I, I don't love it, but I do it because it needs to be done. And I appreciate that it's done. I had someone ask me once if it gave me satisfaction to do this type of work, to clean, the, keep the house clean and to cook for my family, that there's just this ultimate satisfaction in this activity. And I thought, no, not really. I really think everybody needs to be involved in keeping the house presentable and doing stuff. I mean, doing stuff and looking after our family is important to me but not important as my sole job or responsibility. And we have since discovered that it is something you are much better at than I am. It's too bad we didn't learn that lesson early on in our marriage. Right. Uh, what did your parents do for a living while you were growing up? Well, my mom largely stayed home. And it wasn't until I was older, and actually I think it wasn't until I was an adult, that she started working and like she worked in thrift stores, you know, retail type of work. And she didn't work a lot while I was growing up. My dad had his own business that he ran for several years. I don't even know how long it was. I remember he had it. He cleaned carpets and did flood restoration and even fire restoration. I think that was actually what was part of his downfall. Is that like right your entire time growing up as a young child? He was doing that? Mostly, yeah. Like I think when I was a baby, he worked at Kraft Foods. Okay. I don't remember him ever working there. So, but as far back as I can remember, when I was quite young, he had started his own company and it was a carpet cleaning company. And he had that business into my early teens. And then he went bankrupt. Unfortunately, our house was tied up in that. So we lost our house too. And, you know, it, like everything and that put us into further uh, difficulties. And they never really recovered after that, eh? No, never did. He got involved in a lot of different businesses. I don't recall him actually, he may have had one or two short term type jobs or whatever. He largely had these businesses that he would start. So they're like multi level marketing businesses and what these products and later on, he worked in security until he was rather forced to retire. Like you weren't at home anymore. In fact, I don't think it was until they moved to Lethbridge that he started working with the commissioners. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think he started working with them. I don't know if he worked with that before. I don't know what he was doing after we moved out here, what sort of work he was doing. I mean, I know he had businesses, but he never actually made any money from them. I think he mostly spent money on them. And you said you were the oldest of seven children. Do you know what your siblings are doing for work right now? My sister's next in age. She's a teacher in BC. My brother next to that, he got a librarian degree, I believe. And he's currently working, I believe, for a law company. And he manages their social media. That's the last I heard. I'm not sure if that's still. He left there a few years ago. Okay, what you doing now? Well, he was self-employed as a website developer. Right. But has since moved on with the company. So he's a website developer for this website development company. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure he has a library degree, doesn't he? Yeah. He was working for a law office managing their library until he went out on his own to do website development. So he's got that. The others, I mean, they've had different jobs. I One of my brothers is in construction and he and his partner had a, a store that they ran. I don't know. I've, I've never been to it, but I think it was like fantasy type of stuff that they sold but he's also worked in construction and I think he's got like I don't, I'm not sure which level of you know I, I know that they have all those different levels so he's doing that uh, another brother as a single dad uh, I believe at one point he was working for a nonprofit organization I'm not sure exactly what he's doing now uh, I don't really talk to a lot of my siblings very often yeah for a little while he and his partner were doing like catering or something. And then they were also selling different brands of whiskey. Oh, okay. I haven't kept up with how that's been going, if that's still something they're doing, or if they're doing something different now. Uh, the younger sister who was working for Shaw for a while, doing customer service, she, she's done a few different jobs like that, customer service um, type of work or support systems. And a younger brother who has worked in different factories. Your younger sister, the youngest sister, wasn't she working for an insurance company? Last I heard, I think she was working for an insurance company. And she was at some point. I, mean, I don't think she's doing that now, but I think she did at some point. Yeah. All right. And she's getting ready to have a baby pretty soon she is yeah so that's what everybody did i mean the, the sister who's next in age to me she was the first one to get a university degree and, um, and then she got an education degree as well and then brother 
next he went to university yeah you know, the, they've all gone to different you know Did, didn't he go to langara yeah i think that's where it was all right so a question that i always ask uh, my guests is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker and so you know that's basically how has your gender your sexuality your ability levels economic class religion ethnicity or whatever how have those influenced how you've experienced the workplace well i think largely because i was raised to always be nice that that has influenced how i have interacted with some in the workplace where you know i will prioritize being the nice person and not making waves i don't think my identity has even though you know perhaps as a woman uh, identifying as a woman that that may have had some influence i think now i don't know if ageism is involved in the fact that i've only been able to get short-term contract jobs in the last few years i think that could very well play a role uh, i didn't really think about it because i was diagnosed as an adult with adhd that i started to wonder if my short-term positions that i held was related to that that's entirely possible i think that's what i was trying to get at earlier in our conversation <laughs> That's all I can really think of. I am in a very privileged position as a white Canadian. You know, it's been a few generations since my ancestors who immigrated and settled here. So I'm seen as, you know, a bona fide Canadian. So I haven't faced any of those um, issues that I know many newcomers face. Otherwise, I can't think of anything else where... I was, so I'm also, you know, a cis heterosexual person. I don't think that's ever come up, but it wouldn't because it's seen as the norm, right? So. All right, cool. Uh, any final thoughts for our listeners? You know, honestly, the only regrets that I have is that I didn't go back to university earlier. I wish I had done that. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have gone in the direction that I've gone now. And I have absolutely learned to love the type of research that I engage in. And um, I want to keep doing it, you know, as long as possible. Awesome. And if people are interested to, you know, follow you and your work, is there anywhere that they can go to do so? Social media, or if you have like website or I'm on Instagram. I don't get on there a whole lot, but I do sometimes. I'm still kind of on Twitter and I refuse to call it X. It's Twitter. And the same, I don't get on there very often. It's mostly to engage with some of the, you know, people that I follow or who follow me. I'm on Facebook. I will post things that are of interest to me. You know, there's there's nowhere else that I'm really uh, largely involved in except there. And it's just just my name. Awesome. And if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. While you're there, you might as well sign up for our email newsletter. We have daily, weekly, and monthly versions available. If you like this podcast episode, please rate and review it. And we'd also depend on the support of listeners just like you. Please, if you are interested in providing some financial support, whether a one-time donation or a monthly subscription for as little as a dollar a month, just visit us at albertaworker.ca slash support. Thank you, Mary, for joining us today. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity. Thank you.